I think we're ready to get started. Thank you all so much for your patience. We have all of our panelists here today. Um, my name is Danielle Edwards. My pronouns are she, her. And I'm really excited to be moderating this final panel for you at the Roth Gerber Conference. Um, we're going to be talking about reproductive rights this afternoon, which if you've been following the news, it's been a busy week. Um, so we're, we have a lot of questions for our our panelists here today, but um, just to get started, I'm going to um, briefly introduce our, our panelists as they are going to give kind of a five minute overview of the work that they're doing. And then we're going to have an in depth conversation about kind of where, where things are at today is actually probably uh, the most relevant since things just happened a few hours ago. Um, but really excited to have you all here and to be a part of this um, conference. So we're going to start with Professor Martha Davis, and she is a professor at Northeastern University School of Law, and she's going to get started kind of with the background of um, what happened after Dobbs and kind of what led up to it. Um, I'm not going to read their full bios because they have extensively successful careers, all three of our panelists do, but I would encourage you to read them in in, in our um, program if you want to learn everything that they have done. So, you can Professor do one Davis, at time. yeah, okay. I'll let you start. Thanks. Okay, so thanks to Danielle for that introduction. Thanks to Suzette for putting this together. We're on very first name basis here. And, uh, <laughs> um, uh, and uh, you know, I really enjoyed the, the day so far. So thank you so much. Um, so uh, I'm going to give a, just a background of the Dobbs case and then talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what's happened since then. Uh, the Dobbs case arose uh, when the Jackson Women's Health Organization, a reproductive rights clinic, challenged a Mississippi law that banned abortions after 15 weeks, which was a clear violation of the federal case law that established that states could not ban abortion before fetal viability. The Mississippi law was intended to be provocative. Uh, it was enacted specifically in the hope that it would serve as a vehicle to modify the framework that was adopted in Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey, moving from a viability line to a 15-week line for abortion. Uh, but once just Justice Ginsburg passed away and, Amy Justice, and Justice Amy Coney Barrett joined the Supreme Court, Mississippi's attorneys shifted their strategy to ask that the conservative majority of the court, supermajority of the court, reverse Roe v. Wade and eliminate the federal constitutional right entirely. And Justice Alito's uh, majority opinion in Dobbs did just that. And um, you know, we may never know who was responsible for the leaked draft that was mentioned earlier, but the predictions about the Dobbs decision's impacts have really proved to be uh, quite accurate. And um, so uh, I think the key themes in the 11 months since the Dobbs decisions, uh, decision are legal instability and uncertainty. And uh, as my title indicates, this uncertainty is not a bug, it's a feature. Um, uncert it's uncertainty and it's the appearance of uncertainty that serves the policy goals of the folks who want to prevent abortions. Um, it's also a feature of the Supreme Court's disregard for precedent. As a legal matter, the Dobbs decision was uniquely unsettling because the, um, because the court excised the fundamental right to abortion from the Constitution, even though it had been recognized repeatedly by courts for almost 50 years. And while some, but not all, of the Dobbs majority tried to limit their opinion to abortion alone, there's no doubt that the Dobbs decision uh, has destabilized the law around privacy, bodily autonomy, contraception, marriage equality, and all of the other fundamental rights that may not have been imagined by the white men who drafted the 14th Amendment in 1868. This legal destabilization occurred not only because of the court's backward looking reading of the 14th Amendment, but also because of the court's willingness to discount the factors that support adherence to precedent. For example, by asserting that pregnant people's reliance on access to abortion was not constitutionally significant. So now state level abortion restrictions must simply meet the rational basis test to pass constitutional muster. Uh, to be sure, some of the state level restrictions seem irrational, right? But in the past, the federal courts have applied the mere rationality test to, very deferentially to uphold state level prerogatives despite their harmful impact. So really there is no federal baseline uh, that's meaningful um, right now in terms of abortion access itself. Meanwhile, the focus of, the con of constitutional litigation on abortions has turned to the states, even while the federal courts continue to address issues around FDA regulation of medication abortion you know, on an hourly basis now. Um, so predictions of chaos have been uh, fully realized. Um, I'm not talking about uh, variations in um, uh, 
speed limits, you know, between states. These are variations in, um, you know, access to health care uh, for people. So a very, uh, very important personal right. So as of April 10th, and things may have changed since then, um, the Allen Guttmacher Institute reports that 14 states completely ban abortion with only narrow exceptions. For example, Oklahoma and Arkansas uh, permit abortion only to save the pregnant person's life, not for the other sort of criteria that some states uh, allow. And for those states that allow abortion, restrictions are all over the map, um, from Colorado and five other states, where, which have no time restrictions, to states with viability lines, to Nevada with 18 weeks, to Georgia and possibly Florida, as we read in the paper this morning, I think, that uh, possibly a dozen other states have six weeks before many people even know that they're pregnant. And then there are a host of other specific restrictions that vary from state to state. Um, so not surprisingly, these wide variations um, depending on which side of the border you're on, have caused a lot of confusion. Um, in states that allow abortion only to save a life or to preserve health, doctors are chilled from offering any abortion services to patients. Doctors may risk a felony conviction or jail time if their judgment is deemed flawed. And this is what I mean by the um, chaos being the, you know, part of the goal, is the uncertainty is, just, is effective in actually preventing abortions even when the law itself would permit them. Um, pregnant people with resources may be able to, able to obtain abortions in states where abortion is legal, but of course dealing with the logistics of travel is, is difficult when you're especially you're doing it in a particular time frame. And some states have sought to criminalize it. And just a few days ago, Idaho became the first state to explicitly restrict some out-of-state travel for abortions, enacting a law that criminalizes helping a pregnant minor get an abortion in another state without obtaining first parental consent and the offense is punishable by two to five years in prison. It applies even if the parent whose consent is required was, the rape, was a rapist and raped the child. Many pregnant people have sought predictability by relying on medication abortions, uh, which is the prevalent form of, of achieving abortion now. But as a result of this ongoing litigation challenging FDA approval of mefepristone, access to the most effective med method of medication abortion is now in question nationwide. I guess I gather that it's, it's available now through Wednesday um, as a result of the Supreme Court's uh, ruling today. So it remains legal today, but the litigation of this issue is gonna be playing out in the, in the near term and maybe in the long term too. Um, this instability has huge costs, particularly for individuals. There's stress, economic burdens, the health consequences that fall hardest on people of color and marginalized populations. So a, a lot of um, significant costs to the, to, um, to the, to the, to the community and the, and the population. And the instability seems likely to continue uh, into the future. Think about the recent election in Wisconsin, which has been mentioned today, um, where access to abortion hung in the balance, depending on the outcome of the state Supreme Court election. 39 states use some kind of election as part of selection or retention processes for state court judges. Uh, and so going forward, abortion may be on the ballot with every judicial election. Um, and we also know how ephemeral state constitutional protections can be. Uh, state constitutions are much easier to amend than the federal constitution. The average number of amendments for state constitutions is 115, uh, more than four times the number of amendments to the federal constitution. So the bottom line is that all this instability undermines the rule of law. And this you know, relates back to the keynote that we heard this morning. The, key, the rule of law has already been stressed in recent years. Legal stability and predictability are fundamental, a fundamental part of what people mean when they talk about the rule of law. The, the idea that you can know what the law is and can act in accordance with the law. Yet we've already seen anti-choice attorneys general seek to exploit uncertainty by threatening pharmacies that prescribe mefepristone in particular, even as, as it remains legal. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, in most of our peer nations, uh, Canada, England, New Zealand, and so on, abortion is viewed as an essential part of reproductive health care, along with contraception and prenatal care, not as a political football. And international human rights norms uh, name access to abortion as a component of the quote, human rights to life and health. So under international human rights law, the human rights attach at the time of birth. And someone who is born then can, can claim these, this right to health, right to life. So along those lines, to just say a word about what I'm working on, I'm working on a project to look at state and federal due process clauses, which protect life, liberty, and property to think about the meaning of substantive protections for life. Um, so given the extreme state level of restrictions, it's important to establish that life, life is not simply the opposite of death, 
that states' obligations to protect life aren't discharged so long as someone's breathing, uh, but that the protections are at least somewhat broader, including health and elements of dignity for pregnant people. Um, these are the kinds of things that you end up having to work on when things are as extreme as they are. You know, it's not a great victory to prove that life is a little bit broader than, than breathing. Uh, still, you know, it, we're, our hope is that it'll be some utility in this. Um, so uh, still at the same time that we're addressing like all of these questions that are raised by state level litigation, I, I want to just also situate this within the, uh, the impact of this instability uh, on the rule and of law itself, and that it fits into a larger agenda about, um, about uh, you know, the rule of law generally. So thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Davis. Um, next, we're going to move to Kiki Council, who is a fellow uh, law buff. And uh, Kiki is the legal counsel for the pro bono initiatives at the Lawyering Project, where she helps to coordinate the Abortion Defense Network. So thank you, Kiki, for being here today, and tell us what you're up to. Oh boy, it's so much. Hi everyone, I am Kiki Council, she, her. Um, I am an alum of CU. The last time I was in this room was to do the Kerrigan mock trial talk, <laughs> um, which I won, so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it's like really surreal to be here. Thank you so much, Professor Melville, for inviting me. Um, so a couple of things, first of all, if there's any press in the room, I would like to state that everything that I'm about to say is personal. It is not a reflection of necessarily a reflection of the beliefs of the Loring Project. Um, second of all, abortion is a really heated topic um, and it's a difficult topic and it's a topic that requires a lot of precision in language. And so I'm going to describe things in ways that maybe you're not used to, but how we describe abortion is really, really important and how we talk about it is extremely important. Um, and if you have questions about the words or phrases I'm using, I'm more than happy to answer them. But I do also want to acknowledge that this is a deeply personal issue. It's part of the reason why I fight so vigorously for it because it is a private personal issue about your body and your autonomy. Um, and for many of us in the room, especially those of us that have uteruses, um, we feel that we've been stripped of this autonomy and that the government has essentially failed us. And that's a lot of big feelings that I don't feel like we acknowledge, one, as lawyers, but two, we often completely get lost in the miasma of the law and forget that there are people right now on planes traveling to Colorado who just want health care. <laughs> They're having miscarriages. They're pregnant and they don't want to be pregnant. They're trying to get gender affirming care, which I would constitute as being part of reproductive justice and care. Um, and they don't have the same rights as I do just because of where their zip code is basically. Um, and we forget to be patient and people focused. So often in the law, we become completely alienated from it. So as an attorney, as an activist, as somebody that is not normally a researcher or a scholar in this area, that's how I sort of approach this work. Um, so I'm working on a lot of different things. If you know me personally, like I love abortion so much. I'll just talk about, I'll give you stickers. I have shirts. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love abortion. I love talking about abortion. Um, and what I do full time at the Loring Project is help facilitate a website called abortiondefensenetwork.org, where basically we work to connect abortion seekers, abortion providers, and abortion supporters, which we define very broadly, with attorneys that are willing to provide pro bono help. Um, for any sort of defensive work they might need, whether that's license revocation, zoning violations, civil lawsuits, criminal prosecutions, confidential legal advice about how to import pills and distribute them across the United States, if they could even do that, et cetera. Um, so that's my main work. And through that work right now, what has most manifested into like a total nightmare and then kind of dissipated in the last like 20 minutes <laughs> um, is the Mifepristone case in, um, that has arisen in two different um, jurisdictions. There's a case in Texas that's basically challenging, super forum shopped, like the best forum shopping there ever was to the extent where one of the plaintiffs like founded their organization in the forum where they wanted to shop for a specific judge. It's really really amazing strategy, um, legal strategy. Um, but anyway, so there's one uh, case from Texas that is challenging 
several aspects of the FDA approval of and continued modifications of um, basically how mifepristone, which is one of the abortion drugs, is distributed, prescribed, sent across the mail, et cetera. And then there's an opposing case in Washington state, um, which has 17 states, including Colorado, um, that's basically saying the opposite. Um, we don't need to get rid of mifepristone. What we need to get rid of are the restrictions on mifepristone is essentially what the Washington case is saying. Um, there's dueling rulings right now. The Fifth Circuit came out on Wednesday. I don't remember. Um, yeah, it, I really yeah, yeah. haven't slept in a long time. Um, <laughs> Wednesday and they're like, hey, uh, I think Texas is kind of wrong. I think actually that we should just roll it back to the year 2000 with the label from 2016 and the REMS, which are basically the restrictions all the way back to the year 2000. That caused a bunch of overnight chaos because I have a bunch of doctors with a bunch of mifepristone and they don't know what they can do with it on uh, Saturday. And part of it is exactly what Professor Davis is saying. We have 50 states with 50 different schemes and regulatory schemes, and we have the administrative state on top of that. So it, you can imagine all of like five abortion lawyers in America who take clients scrambling around during the week being like, I don't know what to tell this doctor in California versus this doctor in Tennessee. And even though abortion's banned in Tennessee, mifepristone is used for miscarriage care. So what can they do? Abortion doesn't even exist there. They're banning an abortion pill, but it's not used for abortion in Tennessee. So that was my week. Um, and then Supreme Court just said, oh, we're going to administratively stay it till Wednesday. So now I don't have to worry about it till Wednesday. <laughs> um, we are also seeing a lot of interesting cases around the FACE Act. So for those that don't know, the FACE Act is a statutory scheme that came into being in the late 90s to protect workers um, and abortion clinics from people trying to break in, intimidate them, prevent abortions from moving forward, et cetera. Um, for some reason that many of us don't understand, the Biden administration is construing crisis pregnancy centers to be reproductive health care centers under the FACE Act, and they are prosecuting individuals who are defacing crisis pregnancy centers with graffiti. Um, so we've seen a couple of those cases pop up um, in Florida and in New York. There was also one in Wisconsin, but that guy firebombed the clinic. So I think it's a little different, um, but still, um, <laughs> still a question as to whether it's properly brought under the FACES Act. Um, so I'm doing a bunch of research on that. Locally in Colorado, I do a lot of political activism and legislative advocacy. So the big big bill that I passed last year was the Reproductive Health Equity Act. We did that because Colorado was one of, at the time, 11 states that said absolutely nothing either way about the right to seek an abortion. Our entire abortion scheme was upheld by Roe v. Wade, and that was really cool when Roe v. Wade was a thing. But most of us, I think, in this space knew, at least as of December 2021, when the Supreme Court had heard oral argument on Dobbs, that it was game over. Um, and so I started panicking <laughs> um, and writing all of my legislators and letting all of the coalition in Colorado know that we need to get something on the books um, to protect our fundamental right to seek reproductive health care. So we defined abortion for the first time in Colorado's statutory scheme. We very broadly defined reproductive health care. It's a gender neutral bill, which is really awesome. It protects your right to choose or refuse birth control, to choose or refuse to get an abortion. It definitively, think God says that fetuses and fertilized embryos don't have derivative personhood rights in Colorado. Um, and fourth, very importantly, as we're kind of seeing play out now, it makes anything related to reproductive health care a matter of statewide concern, which essentially gives us state preemption and prevents mm the municipalities from passing individual bills that might create sanctuary cities for the unborn, ban abortion clinics, et cetera. Um, so hooray, we did that. It turned a year um, basically last week. Um, approximately 30 minutes ago, we just signed into law three additional bills, hooray. Um, so sad that I missed the bill signing, but whatever, I wanted to hang out with all of you. Um, <laughs> so the first was SB 23188, which is protections for um, accessing reproductive health care. That is our super comprehensive bill that is essentially our shield law, which I know 
Rachel will be talking about soon. We love shield laws. We have a super comprehensive shield law now. It extends all the way to preventing um, insurance carriers from discriminating against abortion providers in Colorado. There's 26 sections. I'm not gonna go through them. You can look it up. You're law students. Um, it's really great. Um, SB 23189 is increasing access to reproductive health care. That is a bill that covers insurance and requires private employers um, to create and carry insurance that covers abortion care in Colorado. Um, and then SB 23190, that was the bill that I worked the most on, much to the chagrin of every anti-abortion person in the state of Colorado. Um, we made it a deceptive trade practice for crisis pregnancy centers to lie about the services that they provide, because I can't tell you how many people were in Texas or Oklahoma and calling what they thought were abortion clinics in Colorado, buying entire plane rides, and then getting here, contacting um, COBOL or another fund to try to get financial assistance to cover the cost of their abortion, and then finding out they're not getting an abortion. They're getting weird not healthcare from a very religious person in a creepy building. So um, <laughs> that's now a deceptive trade practice. <laughs> um, and that bill also makes it unprofessional conduct for any licensed medical professional to prescribe abortion pill reversal, which doesn't exist. Um, in addition to that, what we have coming down the pike in Colorado are a couple of ballot initiatives in 2024. We're going to run a ballot initiative to repeal the public funding ban, which is our state version of the Hyde Amendment. It came onto the books and it was added as an amendment to the state constitution in the late 80s. Um, and then we're also going to enshrine the Reproductive Health Equity Act into the state constitution. I looked it up. We have 168 amendments to our state constitution. <laughs> um, so quite a few. Um, really excited to run those as ballot initiatives instead of being at the General Assembly and getting yelled at by Senator Bob Gardner. Um, we are also thinking about challenging the Parental Notification Act um, in a lawsuit um, after we pass those bills. If you don't know, the Parental Notification Act requires any minor in Colorado who wants to get an abortion to notify their parent before they receive the abortion. I represent those minors in court on behalf of Planned Parenthood of the Rocky Mountains. Um, it's a really dumb, dumb requirement. Um, you know, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, when we wrote the bill in, or when the bill was written, I didn't write it. Um, in 1998, <laughs> um, the legislative declaration says that the state has a vested interest in preserving the family unit. And what happens in these cases are teenagers who have already had a massive failure of parental and adult support in their lives. There is no unit to preserve, essentially. The teenagers who are pregnant and who want their parents involved in their decisions involve their parents in their decisions, and that's the case for the vast majority of minors who seek abortion care. But even if it weren't, there's so many studies and external policies that show that minors are more than capable of making bodily autonomy decisions um, without forced parental involvement or notification. And again, this bill only harms the people that have already had that critical failure in their life. These are people that are going to be abused or kicked out of the house, have an upheaval of the family unit at home if they express that they're having sex outside of marriage, that they have a boyfriend, let alone that they're pregnant and that they're seeking an abortion. Um, and it doesn't always capture the right thing, right? And um, a, a lot of Muslims believe that it's not haram to get an abortion before the third month. What's haram is being a teenager and having sex outside of marriage. And so I had a Muslim teenager who wanted to get an abortion. The abortion wasn't what her family was going to be mad about. What they were going to be mad about was the fact that she was having sex. Um, so we're not even actually addressing the alleged social ill of abortion with the bill. Um, so yeah, hopefully we can get rid of that. Um, and then in addition to all of this, because again, I just love abortion so much, um, I work as an activist and I do a lot of protests. Um, I work particularly with Shout Your Abortion. Shout out to Shout Your Abortion. They're an amazing organization. We do concerted actions in certain locations. A lot of them have been in Texas and in DC. I went to DC for 4th of July last year. We put an abortion pill lemonade stand in front of the Supreme Court and educated the public about abortion pills. 
Um, I am trending along the line of legal nihilism at this point and am really, really into civil disobedience and mass civil disobedience as a way of just ignoring whatever the heck it is that the courts are doing um, and would love to talk about that more. So yeah, I'm really excited for the discussion and yeah, looking forward to talking about abortion, which I wish we all had drinks because you all would be very drunk by the end of this if you drank every time I said the word abortion. Um, <laughs> if you're watching at home. Um, so <laughs> I will pass it on. Thank you, Kiki. And yes, our final panelist is Dean Rachel Rubiche, who is the Dean of Temple University Beasley School of Law and the James E. Beasley Professor of Law. So thank you so much for making it. You literally got landed in Denver and drove straight here. So thank you so much for being here. <laughs> well, thank you and apologies for being late. I think as the organizers know, I was, I've been so excited to participate. Um, my day job as a law school administrator, we had an event yesterday in Las Vegas that we could not cancel and it's been on the books for ages and ages. So took the first flight I could, of course it was a little delayed and then booked it through the airport. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very sorry. We, Kiki and I were joking. It did occur to me, where is the exit? How do you get out of this airport? <laughs> but, um, but no, no, thank you. Um, and this is my first time in Boulder, and it's my first time at the University of Colorado Law School. And so i um, delighted to be here and just have to also say thank you to Lindley, to Danielle, but also um, Professor Suzette um, Malbo, who, as everyone knows in this room, is a national leading expert on access to justice and whose work on employment discrimination has been really inspiring to me personally. So I wanna say a special thank you to you because for your leadership and for everything you've done for the field. But um, okay, um, so Kiki stole my thunder. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, the new form of law that she mentioned, shield laws. Um, and I was very excited to do that today because of Colorado becoming the 11th state to pass a shield law. So congratulations to you, Colorado. Um, and so the, it's an exciting day to talk about this because I think as Professor Davis mentioned, um, uh, you know, the, the landscape that we find ourselves in is one of confusion and it's one of conflict. And so, um, the, the, the interstate conflicts that have developed as states seek to implement their abortion policies, um, that, is, that characterizes abortion regulation after Dobbs. And there's reason to think that states aren't necessarily going to stop in banning abortion. The 14 states that Martha mentioned aren't gonna stop in just uh, banning uh, abortion within their borders. There's really good reason to believe that uh, those states are going to want to extend their policies as far across their border as possible because the end goal, I think, for much of the abortion, anti-abortion movement is to not just end abortion in Texas, but to end it everywhere. And so that's a little bit of what we're seeing in the FDA litigation, which I'm delighted to talk about in Q&A, um, but it's also what has prompted these 11 states to pass what have been called shield laws. So, and they're not, just, they're not just hypothetical. So to just give you an example, the Texas Freedom Caucus is on the precipice of passing an SB8 style law that creates a cause of action for, uh, against anyone who assists a Texan leaving the state to procure an abortion elsewhere. Uh, the National Campaign for Life has, was successful in Idaho in passing a model le a legislation that it had drafted as a model, which I, Idaho adopted, which creates the offense of abortion trafficking and it applies to minors. So um, it's a, a criminal and civil penalties for people who help minors uh, leave the state to obtain abortions outside of the state. Now, that's a really tricky law because it it technically only applies to people within the state of Idaho helping minors uh, who have been trafficked. Uh, but of course, travel doesn't mean anything if you can't come home. And so this is, a, this is the next generation of laws that we should expect to see. So um, what do shield laws do? Um, 
I wanted to just dig into a little bit of uh, the specificity that, that characterizes their provisions across the board, some of the general themes, uh, so we can tee up our discussion for maybe what happens next. So these are laws that seek to increase access for out-of-state patients seeking services outside of, outside of where they reside. Uh, seeking to protect the providers and the people who help providers within the shielding state, providing what is legal abortion care within that state. And so just a, a, a quickly, because I know we, we, we don't, uh, I don't want to um, take up all of our time that we would have for questions. I know Danielle has drafted some really great ones. Um, here's what they do. So as, as Kiki mentioned, first, the shield laws across the board try to protect in-state providers' licenses and malpractice insurance rates. So um, if a state uh, tries to impose criminal or civil liability on a healthcare professional providing abortion to someone from another state, that prosecution or lawsuit could be reported to the provider's licensing board. And those licensing boards have broad discretion in determining or, uh, uh, how ethics and uh, uh, standards of ethics for relevant to professional conduct apply. So being named a defendant too many times or being subject to a disciplinary investigation, even if the provider ultimately prevails, um, could result in licensure suspension, higher malpractice insurance costs, reputational damage. So shield laws, prohibit state medical boards and in-state malpractice insurance company from taking any adverse effect, uh, uh, any adverse action against providers who face out-of-state legal consequences. Um, this is not blanket immunity for providers. The laws are, are targeted uh, in, uh, in addressing out-of-state investigations and disciplinary actions, lawsuit or pro prosecutions connected to the protected reproductive health care. And Colorado is one of the states that, like Massachusetts, defines productive, uh, reproductive health care uh, more broadly and includes, for, in their, for instance, gender affirming care. So um, that's number one. Number two, uh, shield laws attempt to thwart interstate investigations and discovery, both civil and criminal, of the care provided to patients from other states. So on the civil side, most states have enacted some form of the Uniform Interstate De Depositions and Discovery Act just rolls right off the tongue as a <laughs> Uniform <laughs> Act. Um, and that simplifies the process for litigants to take depositions and engage in discovery from another state. On the criminal side, um, the Uniform Act to secure the attendance of witnesses from without a state in criminal proceedings, another, uh, another one that just trips off the tongue, uh, that is a Uniform Act that a version of every state has enacted and it accomplishes the same goal for witness summons in criminal cases. So even before witnesses are called, police departments usually work together across state lines via formal and informal cooperation agreements. So, States uh, passing shield laws have exempted abortion providers from interstate discovery and interstate witness subpoena laws while prohibiting state and local law enforcement agencies from cooperating with other states' investigations. Um, this only applies to abortions that are legal in the provider state, and such an exemption does not protect providers if traveling to an anti-abortion state that seeks to target their conduct that provider would be subject to that state's laws um, or judgment entered in that state's courts. Nevertheless, uh, shield laws try to prevent courts and the law enforcement agencies in the shielding state from becoming a cooperating arm of another state's investigation apparatus. Third, shield laws exempt abortion providers from the state's extradition requirements, so long as the individual consistent with Article 4 of the Constitution is not fleeing from justice, covering the provider who never stepped foot in another state. So outside of constitutional requirements, some states' extradition laws permit or obligate the state to extradite accused criminals, even if they have never been to that other state and thus have not fled. Shield laws create exceptions to those requirements. Fourth, um, on the civil side, shield laws create a cause of action against anyone who interferes with lawful provision of reproductive health care or support. So these provisions recognize out-of-state judgments as required by the full faith and credit clause, but subject the person seeking to enforce it to a new state tort claim 
for interfering with reproductive health care provision that was lawful in the state in which it occurs. Finally, and fifth, and controversially, uh, states have attempted to protect providers who are not only providing care to those traveling in their state, but also to providers mailing medication abortion pills out of state, um, even, in, even to states that ban abortion. So telehealth policies and the standard of care typically define the location of care is where the patient is. Teleabortion policies um, are starting to define the location of care is where the provider is, uh, using language like in the Massachusetts Shield Law, um, care that is protected regardless of where the patient is located. So this is pretty big. Um, the provider would not, according to the home state, be in violation of any other state's abortion law or licensure law. Um, and this, I think, this provision, I, I like to end with it because it really gets at the heart of what comes next in our abortion debates. We've seen it this week in the FDA litigation. Uh, we've seen it over the last couple of years with the emergence of clinics that are entirely virtual uh, that offer uh, counseling uh, and uh, intake online and then mail abortion pills to people uh, using telehealth. That is a, um, that is a practice that uh, exists in states that in, in which uh, telehealth for medication abortion is legal. Um, but the, the threat of mailed abortion pills to the anti-abortion movement is at the heart of the litigation we're seeing now and is at the heart of the debates that we're going to see to come. And so this telehealth provision in, uh, uh, that is emerging in SHIELD laws is, its own, um, is, 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 is also a response to uh, the, the proliferation of mailed pills. I am very happy to talk more in Q&A. Uh, this is, I'm pretty nerdy about the subject of telehealth <laughs> for, uh, in, this, in this space, but also about any, uh, any of the ways in which the FDA's rules have changed and what has prompted the litigation of this week. Thanks so much. Thank you all. Well, I think to start, I want to break down kind of what we've been seeing this week with the Fifth Circuit, and I want to start at the basics of preemption, and obviously that's a topic that's been discussed over the course of today's conference, but can you provide maybe Professor Davis um, a definition for those in the room that aren't in law school and even for those of us that maybe need a refresher, um, <laughs> what preemption is and why it is so important in the abortion conversations that we're having today? Sure, so, um, so I'll get started. I mean, the, uh, especially um, Dean Rubichet, but others should chime in because yes, I'm really more familiar with <laughs> state preemption of local um, uh, regulations. But the, um, the idea of federal pre preemption comes from the supremacy clause and the idea that federal law um, uh, is supreme over state law. Mm -hmm. And um, in order to establish pre preemption though, you have to establish that there actually is a conflict. You know, so sometimes you might have something going on in a state enacted in a state that doesn't exactly conflict with what the federal law is. Um, but so the idea of um, the, uh, the, the, is that the FDA regulations that provide, um, uh, you know, le legal access to mifepristone would preempt any uh, state level regulation um, by virtue of, uh, that's in conflict with that by virtue of the supremacy clause. Does that sound right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and there are two cases pending that test uh, preemption theories. Uh, one in West Virginia, one in North Carolina. And, you know, it's essentially the outcome would be if a court agrees, which is a big if, um, if a court agrees that it's the FDA that sets the drug policy for this country and it's the intent of Congress for the FDA to be the final word on a drug's efficacy and its uh, safety, that state laws that legislate counter to those um, to those claims um, are preempted from doing so, essentially creating a medication abortion sized hole in a state's abortion ban um, at, or, and or um, preempting other rules and restrictions enacted by the state that contradict the FDA's protocol. Um, you know, I think that as, uh, as Martha said, you know, that this hasn't been tested in this context. Um, the, the, the leading case in which a court held that FDA preempted a state law 
was ultimately never heard through, you know, through, it, uh, through the merits because Massachusetts, the state in question, uh, changed its policy. Um, and it also avoid, uh, uh, um, involved opioid litigation. Uh, so, you know, there, there are lots of uh, shifting, there are lots of reasons to think about uh, the, both the teeth of preemption policy as applied, but also what might be some longer, longer term uh, implications for making a preemption argument. And Kiki, I know that you said when you were giving your overview of just kind of the realistic outcomes of what's happening for your clients right now in this, could you maybe share a little bit more about what this confusion over this Fifth Circuit ruling, as well as just kind of this preemption discussion that we're having, what actual implications is this having for your clients who are trying to get access to abortion? Yeah, so... Um... As, as I was alluding to, um, the real insidiousness of kicking the issue of abortion back to the states is that we have 50 states with 50 different sets of regulations, and abortion isn't in any way, shape, or form just about the right to choose an abortion. What has always been in the purview of the states are laws around access to abortion. Choice is one thing, access is another thing. And states have always, to some degree, at least under Planned Parenthood v. Casey, have been able to impose some sort of burden on the access to abortion, as long as it's not an undue burden. Undue burden implies that there's some sort of due burden. And let me tell you, there's lots of due burdens, apparently, on abortion. Um, and those range from all sorts of things, like zoning regulations, trap laws against providers, regulating who can give abortion pills out, regulating telemedicine. Um, it's, it really truly runs the gamut. And there are states like Colorado where the only restrictions we've ever had on abortion are the Medicaid ban and the Parental Notification Act. We don't have trap laws. We don't have restrictions on the types of providers that can give abortion. We don't have gestational age limits. We don't have mandatory waiting periods. It's literally a free for all. It makes people very angry if they don't like abortion. <laughs> um, but that's Colorado. You go next door to Utah and you're in a completely different universe. You go to Kansas, completely different universe. And so what the Fifth Circuit did by rolling back the label and rolling back the REMS in the FDA case was basically say, I know you all have been operating under certain medical assumptions and with certain medical behavior for X amount of time, but we're telling you that that's wrong and that you need to turn the clock back. So for about 48 hours, people were asking, well, if the FDA label has now been rolled back, but that label doesn't exist anymore, then that means technically that every prescription is an off-label prescription of the drug. Well, does that matter? Guess what? It depends on the state that you're in. <laughs> like five states ban off-label prescription of abortion medication. But the only state that even allows abortion of those, I don't know if it's five, I think it's five, of those five states, the only one that permits abortion anymore is Ohio. So it's okay for everyone except for people in Ohio, we think. <laughs> but also, are providers even bound to off-label prescription enforcement? I don't know. I think maybe if you're in Ohio, you are. Um, so that's one example. All physicians are bound by REMS for certain prescriptions, right? And so... Um, everybody's bound to a REMS, but what's complicated about the REMS with the abortion pill specifically is that the REMS, the revision to the protocols for dispensing this medicine that was revised in 2021, basically said, you don't have to be a qualified physician or have supervision from a qualified physician to dispense this medicine. You can be a qualified prescriber or provider. So that would include a DO or a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant, depending on the state that you're in. <laughs> the FDA sets the floor and then states compile all sorts of extra regulations on top of it, right? So in certain states like Colorado, if you're a nurse practitioner, you can prescribe the abortion pill to people. But if you're in, let's see, I think Virginia, you can't. <laughs> um, so now all of the nurse practitioners um, you know, that were able to prescribe abortion, maybe if they were sitting in the state of Maryland where you can prescribe abortion as a nurse practitioner and send it into Virginia, 
what does that person do now? We don't know. <laughs> um, or we didn't know for like 48 hours. Now we do know that they can do whatever they want until Wednesday. <laughs> um, so these are the kinds of questions that we are trying to answer in real time. So it's a real time upheaval. And what really made it horrible this week was that the Fifth Circuit issued its opinion at 11.30 Colorado time, 1.30 Eastern time in the morning. So I woke up all bright eyed and bushy tailed and I have like 500 emails in my inbox asking what it means. What does it mean for off label use? What does it mean for complying with the old REMS? What does it mean for all of the mifepristone I have stockpiled in my office? What can I do with them on Saturday? What if the order goes into effect on Friday night and I have patients coming in to see me on Saturday for my abortion? I was telling someone at dinner last night, I've talked to like 50 abortion providers in the last like 48 hours. And the answer for a lot of them is there's a scale of risk here and it's worse for the people in the purple states because you have no shield laws, you have nothing to protect you. Your state might not have joined the Washington AG's case um, and so you're kind of SOL, but if you want to take the risk, go for it. Um, <laughs> that's what I like to tell them, <laughs> but um, it, it is really the, the real long-term implication of all of this that I think many people who practice in this space realize is that doctors are cautious people. <laughs> they don't want to lose their license. They don't want to lose their insurance coverage. They want to be able to maintain those things so that they can give as much care as possible. So when there is this sort of purposeful chaos and purposeful uncertainty, doctors are almost always, always, always going to take the most cautious road possible, even if they don't have to. So even if a practitioner in Colorado could mail pills out, because they're just mildly confused about the possibility of whether that's legal or not, they're just not going to do it. And that removes access from a certain portion of the population. And as discussed earlier, it's always to the detriment of people living at or below the poverty line and particularly to black women. So um, yeah, it really, it causes a mess, yeah. real mess. Thanks, <laughs> let me, the fan. Go so ahead. let me just add, we haven't um, at least directly talked about the Comstock Act oh, portion of the, of the FDA case <laughs> of the Comstock Act was a I don't know the year, but it's an old law. That 1873. Has, is that what, okay, yeah. that, that has not been, um, you know, actively used in, in quite some time, but it was enacted in order to um, uh, deter uh, the spread of immoral material. And uh, it includes a provision that uh, would bar, uh, would allow for criminal prosecution of people that mail um, uh, abortion related material or that I think that's transported on a commercial carrier. Yeah. And um, the, uh, the district court judge um, sort of mused about that as I re read his opinion, but didn't ultimately decide it. And likewise at the Fifth Circuit, but it's in the case. Um, and so that is part of the case that's before the Supreme Court now is whether or not the Comstock Act is actually a live enforceable provision in this in this context. And I, I bring that up partly just to connect it with the preemption um, issue, because one thing, you know, I mentioned um, uh, state preemption of local regulations. One thing that has happened in a few localities is that they have tried to, conservative localities, that they have tried to make their, their um, city or their municipality a, um, an ab abortion-free zone by saying that they are going to comply with the Comstock. They are going to enforce the Comstock Act. Um, you know, as a local matter, and um, uh, arguably, I mean, the places, the place that I know that, of that's done that, um, the, the state came in and said, well, that is impermissible. Your, your Comstock regulation or provision is preempted by the state law that permits uh, the mailing of this material, you know, um, but it's, it's another area where there's a state local conflict, you know, potentially as well as whatever might happen in terms of interpreting the Comstock Act at the federal level. Go ahead. Yeah, one more thing on that too is that um, as far as I'm aware of, Kaczmarek's decision is the first context in which any federal judge has ever found that Comstock would apply specifically to mailing of abortion pills. So that's also significant. While he muses on it and doesn't really get to the merits, he is certainly laying down an analytic framework, much like how Justice Alito laid down an analytic framework for revoking substantive due process in certain contexts. So that's really significant. 
Um, and yeah, there are multiple municipalities like in New Mexico, because they were one of the 11 states that didn't have anything either way about abortion, Clovis, New Mexico, all of the New Mexico towns along the eastern border were the kinds of municipalities that were passing Comstock law type bans. It was attempted in the city of Pueblo, um, I want to say in November. Um, and we were able to get around it because we said Rhea was a matter of statewide concern. Um, they were able to be convinced to pull back on that extreme sort of law. And the whole reason why they introduced that municipal ban was because someone announced that they're going to build an abortion clinic there. So um, these things are happening in real time, but at least they're working in Colorado. <laughs> I don't know about <laughs> everywhere else. <laughs> And thank you, Kiki, for writing Rhea. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> I, I think one of the questions that I myself have had as an, a law student, um, but as well as some of my fellow law students have had, um, about just the merits of the Dobbs decision, um, to, to just kind of go back to what Professor Davis said in her opening remarks, is kind of the, the tension between the right to privacy and um, what we're seeing currently. And so I'd love to hear kind of some of your opinions on what, what do you see? I, I feel like it's been a stripping back of obviously the right to privacy with some of these laws that you know are, are trying to criminalize um, traveling for abortions. Um, and just how, how is all this interacting with the right to privacy, I guess, is the question. I guess I can start. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think it is, it bears repeating that um, there's really good reason to think that laws that extend past state borders and attempt to have an extraterritorial effect um, are unconstitutional as against the right to travel, as against the protections for interstate commerce. But, you know, what does, is there a right to travel? <laughs> so, you know, in, in a sense, the, the Dobbs opinion in eviscerating privacy as a foundation for a protection for pre-viability abortion as you suggest, Danielle, opened up a question of what else is on the chopping block that has been historically protected via the 14th Amendment. And, you know, insofar as um, the votes on the court, you know, Justice Kavanaugh just very cavalierly said, well, no one would try to apply a law across its borders. There's a right to travel. Um, and <laughs> uh, in the same opinion in which, um, you know, Justice Thomas was like, let's do this, uh, you know, let's, let's just make sure that the 14th Amendment is not the basis for any uh, uh, right that is not textually um, part of the Constitution. No, uh, there's another way, there, let's look to the Equal Protection Clause, let's look to other places to protect the, uh, rights like the right to marry or the right to procreation or the right to, you know, fill in the blank. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that that's, that puts a lot of these arguments about privacy and what comes next on shaky ground. Uh, even in thinking about this talk this week uh, and thinking about the ways in which um, the, you know, the, the Comstock Act, for instance, were it to be applied, um, you know, has, is a, you know, there's an argument for disuse. There, there's an argument that uh, even with a textualist analysis, this is a law in which uh, it has not been enforced because of uh, a set of cases in the 1930s that interpreted the act very narrowly, but also public backlash against the Comstock Act uh, because of its intrusion on personal privacy, because of its intrusion uh, in people's um, private affairs. And as I was thinking about that argument as one talking point for why Comstock doesn't apply or shouldn't apply in the ways in which it's being um, in the way in which the Fifth Circuit might have it apply, um, I thought, well, yeah, is this a new opportunity for a court to cut back on uh, constitutional protections for intimate association and for uh, uh, intimate relationships? Um, that cert this certainly could be a vehicle for that. So I'm rambling and I'm sorry, but the, the point is, uh, it. This is such a generative conversation because, of course, this is a this litigation. Our conversation it's it's focused around abortion, but on the table are such are so many issues: uh, issues of federalism, issues of agency's power, deference to agency, issues about whether you know the the 
some of the things that we take for granted in addition to the right that we might have taken for granted under Roe. And so uh, that I think is, is a powerful intersection of the, the, the privacy points, Comstock, um, and a, a little bit of what comes next. Yeah, I'll just say a word about um, state constitutions, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, given the instability now of so many things that have been traditionally, you know, in the past protected by the 14th Amendment, state constitutions become that much more important. And there was a decision out of um, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court recently that was um, interesting. Uh, it was involved a question of um, physician-assisted suicide. So the question was, you know, was, was there a constitutional right to um, physician-assisted suicide? And the SJC said, no, there's not. But in dicta, they went on and said, um, because we, we find that there's not, because there isn't a history and tradition of physician-assisted suicide under our state constitution, which was drafted by John Adams and as the oldest state constitution in the, in the country. Um, but uh, we only reach that conclusion here because we don't see that there's any equality issue raised. Mm -hmm. And if there was an equality issue, i.e. if this involved women, if this involved abortion, if this involved something that race, if this involved some other aspect where we saw an equality issue, then we would not look to history and tradition. Then we would look to, the, to try to protect the, the, you know, the population that would be harmed mm -hmm. by this uh, provision. So they're speaking in dicta to what their interpretation of the state um, you know, equality and due process clause would be in the absence of the federal, ongoing federal protection. So um, interesting. And you know, of course, other state states are being called on to do that kind of thing as well. Did you want to add anything? Yeah, I, I have very controversially always sort of hated Roe. <laughs> um, it's not the best decision. I don't like the trimester framework. I don't think that it makes sense. I don't understand why we relegate decision making to the state during the most dangerous part of pregnancy. That seems asinine. Um, but I wasn't alive to make that argument um, when Roe v. Wade came on and I was only one when Planned Parenthood v. Casey came out. So um, that all said, I think couching abortion in the right to privacy has always been really interesting and sort of confounding to me because it certainly is a private decision, but I think it's more of a liberty issue. I think it's more about the ability to choose who says what you can or cannot do about your body. And I personally and philosophically and legally believe that that should only be you. Um, and if you do not have control over your decisions, and if the government can interfere with your decisions, you have diminished personhood. Um, and if you have diminished personhood, can you really be a full bodied citizen of the United States? And it is really important, I think, for us to confront who the Constitution and who the Bill of Rights are for and what those two documents actually protect. We don't even have an equal rights amendment. <laughs> we don't, women aren't in the constitution. <laughs> we're not in there. We're in there by implication kind of in the 19th amendment, I guess, but like we're not really in there. And so that we do need to confront that, I think. I think we need to be more explicit about who we are including in our rights. And I don't know if that necessitates an amendment. I don't think that it's possible at the federal level at this point. Um, and it does speak to the importance of state constitutions and leaning in on that, but that's still not satisfying to me because again, I'm constantly acutely aware that if I just had the horrible misfortune of being born in Laramie, Wyoming, I'd have completely different rights than I do right now. And that doesn't make sense just because of where I was plopped down um, and where my mother was when I was born, right? Um, so I, I think that it's really important to couch these things in autonomy and to really couch how we talk about them in terms of the government making decisions um, and who the government, whose interest the government really represents, framing things as the state has an interest in the unborn child. Well, why? <laughs> they don't care once it comes out. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, confronting those sorts of questions I think is really important. I'm not happy Roe is gone, but I do think it's an opportunity within all of this chaos to think and reframe how we couch these rights within the constitution. Yeah. I, and because your, your comments about autonomy, um, if you have not read Professor Jennifer Hendrick's work on the, and, and her work on feminist theory on these issues of 
of abortion, pregnancy, um, you know, and the, the, the role of autonomy, then you're missing out because <laughs> it is, uh, I just commend it to you because it's, it's really, I think, some of the most important work in the field. We're very spoiled to have Professor <laughs> Hendricks at the University of Colorado. Oh, wait, can I add one more thing? Because oh, sure. I'm going to keep forgetting to say it. I think related to all of this, and particularly part of the chaos that we saw manifest after Dobbs, including the Comstock issue, is that, and like the biggest lesson learned for everyone, dear future law students, those especially that become politicians, repeal old laws, <laughs> right. repeal the old laws, please. <laughs> um, it happened all across the United States. Wisconsin's law was from the 1800s. Texas's law was from the 1800s. Uh, Michigan's law was from 1931. Comstock is from 1837. All of these laws came back into place and a lot of states might not necessarily have had trigger bans on abortion that automatically kicked in if we had just repealed the bad laws. And part of what we're learning through this collective experience is that we can't just rely on the courts and think that, oh, it's all good now, it's fine. Especially when it comes to civil rights, it's never fine. We gotta be ever vigilant. And when we get a positive ruling on something, enshrining it in statute is absolutely imperative and repealing whatever else was on the books is also absolutely imperative because otherwise it's going to create chaos. I kind of want to turn to, to voting a little bit since we talked about in our last panel, you know, the, the impact that gerrymandering and just inequitable districts can have on the, the legislatures that we have to live with um, and how that ties back to reproductive rights and, and health. And as someone that, you know, I'm sure you all cried when, when Dobbs happened, I certainly did. Um, but how, how can um, we voice our opinions through the voting process if the voting process is as screwed as we just discovered in the last panel? Um, and and what, what can we do, I guess, is my, my question for all of you. What hopes do we have going forward? There, there are some, um, uh, you know, initiatives, very targeted initiatives that are using um, data to identify uh, voters who might be interested, particularly in abortion, if only they had more information and, and so on. There's a organization, I'm not going to remember the name of it now, it might be GALS, something like that, that, um, that targets women in Wisconsin, women, you know, and Kansas and, and so on, um, that, you know, are, are opposed to abortion bans, but may not feel empowered to come out yeah. for it. And the, I think those kinds of efforts have been effective. I know I'm from Kansas originally, and so I had some, you know, conversations with people oh, around the, you. yeah, right, exactly. And, um, uh, uh, you know, there was a lot of uh, tremendous grassroots door-to-door -door effort to get people out. Um, you know, so that's the kind of, that's the kind of thing that can work. Yeah. I, I would say optimistically, though this is now under threat as well, um, we, we have seen moments where there's been a decoupling of antipathy for abortion at the legislative level and what voters actually think and what they actually think about abortion. So places like Kansas and Kentucky in which went, where voters went, voters went to the polls um, and were registered their opinion directly on abortion showed that the stranglehold that, um, you know, that the anti-abortion legislators have uh, in places like Kansas do not translate to broad public opinion that is in step. And so in, in some sense, we need to be vigilant about um, the ways in which there are now targeted efforts to change the ways in which ballots are voted on uh, by the public. And um, with states considering laws that create uh, exceptions for abortion votes only. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that I think uh, is, is part, is in keeping with the... So trending along with my uh, disenchantment with the law, <laughs> I think this is where civil disobedience comes into play. Um, I really do. And I encourage all of you to think seriously about like how bad things have to get before you decide to be disobedient civilly. 
Um, and think about what that means, particularly for you as a lawyer and what it means for you and your client, especially in terms of the attorney client privilege, um, because it doesn't apply to ongoing criminal enterprises and is civil disobedience is an act of breaking the law an ongoing criminal enterprise. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but it's a question I mull about. Um, and I, I really do think that if you're in Texas, like it's game over, like there's nothing we can't roll the clock back right. And so what are people in Texas supposed to do? Just not have abortions? Like, no, I'll, I'll, no. <laughs> um, and, you know, a, a big sort of protest slogan we have at Shout Your Abortion is we will save us. And that's it. We need to have grassroots organizing and we need to have grassroots public education about safe options for abortion and for reproductive community care outside of these systems that are thwarting us. Um, I view these laws as illegitimate. I think that they're wrong morally, ethically, philosophically, like they're just incorrect. Um, and so if there is a safe medical option, which thank God for medication abortion, we do have safe options now. Um, why can't we create communities um, and create networks that work outside of the law to facilitate care for people? We can't rely on the law anymore. It doesn't make any sense. I still am so astounded at the standing analysis as an example of something we take for granted, right? We take standing for granted. <laughs> All of us probably that have ever practiced have gotten kicked out of court on standing at least once. And you like kind of cry about it, but you're like, I know I didn't have standing. Um, <laughs> and you would think, you would think that an article three federal judge would do a really robust standing argument about just disability of an administrative issue. And he biffed it. It's so obscenely bad. Like, I hope that your admin law professors are making you guys read this. I hope your con law professors are making you read this. It's a spectacular example of such a failure of such a basic thing that it really makes you question what's the point? <laughs> um, what is the point of the law? If this is it, right? If we're going to blow up standing for abortion, <laughs> then I guess that's where we're at. So I fully believe in at this point that when there is no hope and there is no hope for millions of people in Texas, particularly for people that cannot travel, that don't have that privilege and luxury, even if we have people funding those abortions and funding those practical support organizations, there are still people that are not going to be able to leave their states to get the care that they want. And if they're able to get that care within their community, again, with outside, outside of the system, why not? Um, and I think it's only through mass civil disobedience, particularly through those that are privileged enough to engage in mass civil disobedience that we sort of start trending in a direction that will radically change things. I think that most of the cool stuff we have in America, we've gotten as a result of people purposefully breaking the law from suffrage for women all the way to the Voting Rights Act. It's as American as apple pie. Um, so I say, like, please vote, obviously, but like, <laughs> <laughs> vote, but educate yourself about abortion, educate yourself about self-managed abortion, buy abortion pills, have them because abortion is community care. It is a public health issue. We are the public and we can take things into our own hands, right? Um, and again, frame it as civil disobedience because these laws are wrong. Uh. <laughs> so good. Um, I love everything you just said. Um, I think I want to end on um, kind of going back to your research, Professor Davis, on what is life, because that's kind of <laughs> kind of where this all comes back to, right? And I, I know that we could have spent the entire time talking about this one question on what is life, but I would love to kind of wrap our discussion on that and why this definition is so hotly debated and kind of where, where you're headed with that and kind of what you think we'll see in the future, you know, in policy, but also, yeah, in legal frameworks right. about what, what is life. Right. So, you know, I don't think this is a panacea by any means, but the, um, you know, as I mentioned, the um, internet under international human rights under the definition of life under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, uh, it's been construed by the UN Human Rights Committee to include a right to abortion um, access, uh, abortion for health, abortion, you know, abortion that um, 
uh, in, in order to address pain and, and ensure that people are, um, you know, have, have uh, access to sort of healthful um, procedures. And um, that uh, provision of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights that's being construed by the UN Human Rights Committee is derived from the Magna Carta, um, the same source of the Due Process Clause in the US Constitution and in state constitutions. And so the idea was, well, if, that, if the UN Human Rights Committee can construe this language in this way that encompasses you know, dignity and health and, and uh, within the term life, um, then is there any way to think about how state constitutions in particular, but also the federal constitution might be looked at in that same way? There's very little, it's really under theorized, there's very little law on what life is under the federal or state constitutions because typically the courts just skip right over that and go to, go to liberty and talk about privacy and, and so on. And so it's kind of a blank slate. And, um, uh, and the, looking at the state level, not so much at the federal, but at the state level, there actually is um, a, a, a practice on some courts of looking at international law. It's not so unheard of for state courts to do that as they're construing their, their um, uh, state constitutions. And so the thinking is, let's see what's out there, you know, what's, what states and the federal courts have said about what life is, which is hardly anything. And, and then let's think about what kinds of scholarship or arguments or you know, historical and so on might be brought to bear to just um, kind of fill out in, in litigation or in legislation and so on that life is actually more than just not death, but includes you know, dignity and, and so on. So that's, that's what we're, we're working on. Yeah, did you have something to add? And I, you know, I, Martha, you'd know much better than I would, but the, it's, it's such an important project because of course, comparative experience shows us that it's in interpreting, in interpret, in interpreting uh, exceptions for health and life that that have been, those have been the inroads into abortion liberalization in, in a number of places. And in fact, it's it's what has prompted such a very um, reactive view from states like Texas. Uh, that will not budge mm -hmm. on the question of uh, a health exception. And I think the project is, is, is so important because they may have to under their own state constitutional law, uh, potentially under uh, the uh, federal constitution. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that I think this is an area where comparative um, experience is, is, is really helpful. Yeah, I just, I think it's brilliant from the perspective of framing things as international human rights, right? Like we are all bound by the law, I guess, um, but of the United States, but even our own Supreme Court has said, right, that in certain instances, international law does preempt even the constitution, right? Um, there are certain international inherent human rights that we do have that have been at least tacitly acknowledged um, by the courts in America. And so framing it that way, because then it's like, well, who cares what the court says? Like, this is an inherent right that I have as a human that should be protected. Um, and life isn't just the opposite of death. Um, but I would also include abortion in the pursuit of happiness. So, um, <laughs> you know, that's my two cents on it. Well, thank you all so much for being here and for giving us your expertise. I want to thank the Byron White Center for having this be a part of this amazing conference. I always like to end any, any talk on abortion to just say abortion is not shameful. Nope. Abortion should be celebrated and you deserve choice. So thank you all so much for being here. If we could thank our speakers. Great, thank you so much. Um, I just wanna deeply thank everyone, our keynote, our panelists, our moderators. Um, for, this for their participation in this really important conversation today. Um, I'm really grateful for this platform. And I'm also grateful that we're in a state that welcomes and encourages in our educational system um, um, the voices and perspectives of those who've been historically marginalized and are currently marginalized today. Uh, we know that in other states, this, this kind of robust conversation and critical thinking would not even um, be possible. So I think these things are absolutely necessary to protect our democracy. So I just want to acknowledge that. 
Um, if you if you are interested in learning more, if you want to get involved, I invite you to go to our program, to go to the resources page, page 17. There's a QR code and we have some organizations, we have some action items, things um, that you can get involved with, national organizations and local groups that are leading the charge. So I want this conference to be um, the, the beginning of the conversation, not the end. And we want you to feel empowered um, to take action if you are so moved. So we hopefully we have some tools and we have information that you can seek. Uh, I want to just take a minute to thank all of my villagers um, for making this happen. Uh, let me start off with our Dean, Dean um, Lolita Innes Buckner for her unwavering support of the White Center and our programming. Um, there are a lot of people who work really hard to make this come together. So let me just uh, take a moment to acknowledge we have our IT folks, the third harmonic live production. So Dan uh, is somewhere, made us look good, sound good. So thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you, Nick, for taking the photos. I appreciate that. Um, those will hopefully be posted and we'll have a recording of the event that you can check out. Um, I want to dearly and deeply thank all of the White Center Fellows for your very hard work in making this happen. So yeah, I see you, <laughs> uh, Charlie Goodnow, Francesca lipinski Deget, Michaela Calhoun, Tia Nelson, Essence Duncan, and Madeline Shalafu-Jean. So thank you so much for your really, really hard work. Um, and then, of course, our events team, uh, Yesenia Delgado, Robin Munn, Nicole Mix, and uh, where is Lindley? Lindley Bell, who is like the master behind the scenes. So we definitely want to give her an amazing shout out. So, so appreciate that. Um, I do want to let you know for all of our speakers, we have gifts that are for you. So hopefully we're going to get those. Please don't forget to pick them up. Make sure that we get them in your hands. Um, a couple of housekeeping matters before we end. Um, for our lawyers in the house, just a reminder, the conference has been um, approved for up to five credits. So uh, be on the lookout for your CLE affidavit that will be coming um, in an email. For our students, you're entitled to pledge credits, so be sure to go ahead and make sure to, um, to, to credit yourselves and get that, pursue that. Uh, there, were, there will be a survey that will go out, and I, I very much would appreciate uh, if you would fill out the survey when it comes in the email. We get these things all the time. I get it. Uh, but we really do want to improve our programming, um, and we want to learn and listen from you. So just take the time, if you would, to give us that feedback, and don't be shy. Uh, and at this point, I'd like to invite folks to a, a networking reception we're going to have in Betcher Hall next door. So those of you who are in person, um, we'd love to have you. It's a wonderful time to get to know the speakers a little bit better, to ask questions, um, find out how they got here, what they're up to, how you can join them. So we'll be doing that um, next door. And thank you to the uh, the folks out, um, the remote audience. I know we have a, a, a very robust audience that is uh, participating online. So we appreciate your interest in our programming and uh, we welcome your, your um, participation as well. Um, before we end, I am gonna ask our speakers to come to the front. Um, before we all sort of um, exit to, to the reception. So I just want to thank everybody again and encourage us all to keep fighting for democracy. So thank you for your time. <laughs>